our reading this evening comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 to chapter 10, verse 4. In the Red Church Bibles, that is in page 694 and over to page 695. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 8 to chapter 10, verse 4. Page 694 and over to page 695. Before we read, let us pray. Heavenly Father, in humility we bow in your presence. And as we hear your word read and preached to us, may your word now and always be our role, your Holy Spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Isaiah chapter 9 from verse 8. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say with pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. But the Lord has strengthened Rezin's force against them and has spurred their enemies on. Arameans from the east and the Philistines from the west have devoured Israel with open mouth. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away, his hand is still appraised. But the people have not returned to him who struck them, nor have they sought the Lord Almighty. So the Lord will cut off from Israel both head and tail, from palm branch and reed in a single day. The elders and dignitaries are the head. The prophets who teach lies are the tail. Those who guide these people mislead them, and those who are guided are led astray. Therefore, the Lord will take no pleasure in the young, in the young men, nor will he pity the fatherless and widows, for everyone is ungodly and wicked. Every mouth speaks folly. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away, his hand is still appraised. Surely wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It sets the forest thickets ablaze so that it rolls upward in a column of smoke. By the wrath of the Lord Almighty, the land will be scorched and the people will be fueled for the fire. They will not spare one another. On the right, on the right, they will devour but still be hungry. On the left, they will eat but not be satisfied. Each will feed on the flesh of their own offspring. Manasseh will feed on Ephraim and Ephraim on Manasseh. Together, they will turn against Judah. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still appraised. Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you live for your riches? Nothing will remain but to cringe among the captives or fall among the slain. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away, his hand is still appraised. Well, the Prime Minister said that it was the largest miscarriage of justice in British history, and the Official Review Commission stated that it represents the biggest single series of, wrong, of wrongful convictions in British legal history. For the last six months or so, all of our news feeds have been packed with stories about the Post Office Horizon IT scandal, where more than 900 sub-postmasters were wrongly convicted of stealing from the post office, when in fact a faulty computer system was in reality the thing to blame all along. You might have even just seen this week, actually, that uh, 
Alan Bates there, man who has sort of spearheaded the campaign for justice, one of those wrongly convicted, was awarded a knighthood by the king this week. Now, one of the most striking things throughout that whole kind of saga that has gone on, you would have seen this if you ever watched the ITV drama about it, was the extent to which senior figures at the post office actually seemed to know about the problems that were going on. They just didn't want to admit that these things were happening whilst the prosecutions were being carried out. It seemed that they knew the figures were faulty. It knew that the, they knew that the system could be tampered with. But still, they just kept publicly saying, no, 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 everything is fine. And so what you seem to have is this kind of situation where you have got clearly a very innocent group of people who have been wrongly convicted and have faced injustice. And it's really like you kind of want a story to be like this, isn't it? You've got the big, bad, arrogant corporation who have got everything wrong. And it sort of fits into a narrative that we would tell ourselves. And it fits into a story of justice that we like to see, where the innocent and vulnerable are shown to be innocent and vulnerable, and the proud and wrong are shown to be so. Now that sort of desire for justice, I think, is a brilliant thing that lies within each one of us, but it also actually ends up leaving us with a little bit of a problem. Because what, what happens when actually the desire for justice ends up turning on us when we end up finding that we are actually the ones who proudly go about doing as we please, even when we know the evidence is stacked against us. And you see, today in Isaiah chapter 9 and 10, we are confronted with God's own desire for justice, for putting right the wrongs that he sees in his own people. But what that meant for God's own people was terrifying, it was really bad news. And so today, we're just going to make our way through these verses in Isaiah 9 and 10. And there are two things I just want to draw out of them. I want to draw out the problem of pride and the problem of judgment. Just those two things. Okay, so the problem of pride. Before we notice that, we just need to remember where we've come from last week. Because it gives us a contrast that is a little bit like night and day. You see, in the first half of chapter 9 that we looked at last week, the Lord extends an incredible picture of hope for his people. That into their darkness, a light would shine that would be utterly captivating in all its brilliance. Where the throne of David had been broken in two, God promised that a future king would come along and he would reunite that kingdom, make it into one, and he would establish an everlasting kingdom, one that was dominated by light, governed by peace, and one that would exude righteousness and justice to the nations. It is an incredible picture of hope. But then you go from that highest mountain peak into the deepest valley, just from the flip between verse 7 and verse 8. Because in the present day, for those hearing Isaiah's message, his message for them is one of complete darkness. There is hope for the future, but there's going to be judgment in the present. You see, Israel was supposed to be a nation that would show what God was like to the world. And they would show what God was like to the world by the way in which they lived. They were supposed to be a nation marked out by compassion for the poor, the weak and the vulnerable, just as God has compassion for those people. A nation of justice and righteousness, just as God himself is just and right in all he does. And yet what they had become could really just be summed up in one word, one simple attitude of the heart. Proud. Let me just read verses 8 to 10 again, which I think show this so clearly. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria 
who say with pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. Over some of the previous chapters in Isaiah, we have seen that the invasion of Israel was imminent as Isaiah was prophesying. Enemy tanks were on the lawn and the prospects for Israel were utterly bleak. Some of their land, in fact, had already been annexed by these enemies that were closing in on them. And what they had in that moment was a choice to make. They could either trust that God would preserve them or they could look to the nation of Assyria, a godless nation, and make an alliance with them. Well, they chose Assyria instead of God. And even now, even as they look around and they see the place beginning to be flattened, even as they see buildings being destroyed and their homeland becoming a wasteland, instead of saying, okay, we need to see that we need God's help right now, that nothing is going to stop our enemies destroying us, we need God, instead what they say is, oh, don't worry about it. You know what, those buildings that they've knocked down over there, they were looking a little bit shabby anyway. Maybe these invading armies are actually going to do us a bit of a favour. You know, these bricks, they're going to knock them down. We'll rebuild them with dressed stone instead, the finest stuff that money can buy. It's not really bleak for us. Things are still going to be good for us. We're still going to prosper. And the fig trees that we've got at the moment... Who needs fig trees? We'll get some of the finest cedar trees in the world imported into Israel, and we will show the whole world how brilliant we are. All this, whilst the enemy tanks were on the lawn, some of their land had already been taken away from them, and their nation was starting to crumble. And yet with pride in their hearts, they say, we're going to come back just better than we were before. You know, it's a little bit like the farcical comedy, um, Don't Look Up. I'm not sure if you've seen that movie. The basic kind of um, premise of that is that a comet is going to strike the earth within about six months, and that comet is going to destroy everything on the earth. And so people have hilarious reactions to the fact that this comet is coming, and some people don't really believe that it is coming, and so they start a campaign with the slogan, don't look up. You know, if you don't look up and if you don't see that the comet is coming, then maybe the comet won't really come and it won't really destroy you. It's kind of ridiculous, it's insane reasoning, and it's entirely arrogant reasoning, and it is exactly what these people in Israel were doing. These people thought they were untouchable. They had ignored God and violated his covenant. And now they simply refused to see the judgment that was coming on them as a result. They just keep saying to each other, don't look up. We'll rebuild. We'll come back. We'll survive. We're going to get through this. We're, in fact, going to be better than we ever were before. God's judgment, it's not really going to affect us. You see the pride Their arrogance, they think God's judgment really means nothing. This is why C.S. Lewis referred to pride as the complete anti-God state of mind. Don't look up. You see, pride stops us from an honest assessment of ourselves. It stopped them from an honest assessment of what was really happening. That they were to be in no doubt, as we are now, that judgment really was coming. You know, you can ignore reality for only so long before reality catches up with you. In verse 11, we see the Lord is bringing their enemies to their door. It's going to be like a pincer movement where the Arameans are going to come from the east and the Philistines are going to come from the west in verse 12. And Israel is going to be no more. And the one doing this in verse 11 is the Lord. The Lord there in capital letters, the God who made a covenant with his people, is now going to act in consistency with that covenant And they are going to face exile for their pride and rebellion against him. 
And even as God says, I'm going to bring your enemies against him, there comes this refrain at the end of verse 12, a refrain that comes up four times in our passage today, and it is just like a drumbeat of God's judgment that marches its way through the foreground of this passage. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. They're really sobering words. In fact, they're even more sobering when you know that actually that idea of God's hand being upraised, well, it's been pointed out that actually that idea is the very same idea of God's arm being outstretched. And if you know the history of God's people, you know that actually they were slaves in the land of Egypt. And what God did when they were humble slaves in the land of Egypt is he came with outstretched arm, is what we are told, and he pulled his people out of slavery and he rescued them. And it's like he is now saying that same arm that came and it rescued you when you were humble slaves in Egypt, that same arm is now extended against you up here in judgment. That is a scary picture, isn't it, for the people of God? The reality of judgment is going to catch up with them, but what is going to stop them acknowledging its reality? Well, it's their continued pride. Verse 13, the people have not returned to him who struck them, nor have they sought the Lord Almighty. They're not going to turn back to God and ask him for help, no. They're going to keep on going their own way. What should they do? They should cry out to God, but in their, in their pride, they'll continue to ignore him and his judgment. And so in verses 15 and 16, his judgment against them is only going to increase. He is going to cut off, he says, in verses 15 and 16, their corrupted leaders and he will leave them in a state of anarchy where their wickedness will continue to burn like fire in verse 18 God says his anger will burn similarly against them in verse 19 these leaderless people will turn each other on each other and begin to destroy each other Until God ends with this final woe against his proud-hearted people. And it really highlights their utter blindness to their situation and their complete pride of heart at the beginning of chapter 10. When that day of defeat comes for them, when the tanks are no longer on the lawn but at the very door, Still full of pride, this people won't cry out to God for help in verse 3. Instead, they will say, where will you leave your riches? Where can I hide my treasure? God is about to wipe us out, but I need to make sure that my treasure is still here so that when we come back from exile, I know where it is so I can collect it again. Do you see the utter delusional thinking amongst God's people? The comet is just above you. Just don't look up. That is what they are doing. Surely the book of Proverbs gets it right when it says that pride comes before destruction because pride stops us having a true assessment of ourselves and it stops us having a true assessment of God. And so the second half of chapter 9 and the opening verses of chapter 10 present us with a really scary picture where God says to his proud and arrogant people, judgment is coming for you. You need to wake up. And it says to us just how serious the problem of pride can be. Even as their land was being taken away from them, still... The people of Israel didn't recognize they were simply getting exactly what God promised they would if they were to violate the covenant. Do we see the problem of pride? The problem of pride for the people of Israel and the problem of pride for us. Pride is the great spiritual killer 
pride and self-sufficiency and ignorance of God, well, they're never going to come up well against God. And he shows here that his judgment will surely come as a result. So that is the first problem. It's the problem of pride. And so the second thing I just want us to look at is the problem of judgment here. If I can come back to the post office horizon scandal. The campaign for justice for those who were wrongly convicted in that scandal has centred upon the overturning of their convictions and also substantial compensation payments to make up for what they've been through. And some of them have already begun to receive that compensation and it is said that all will in time. But there's kind of a problem with that as well. What you might kind of almost call a bit of like a justice shortfall. Alan Bates, who I mentioned earlier, said, how can you put a price on the post-traumatic stress that many continue to deal with. And you can't, can you? You can't put a price on it. Another of the victims said, me and my family have had our lives ruined. We lost our business, we lost our home. It's all too little, too late. And you see, there's a problem, isn't there? Because we sort of think we know what justice should be, yet justice doesn't really kind of feel like it cuts it. Sometimes we know that actually there is a debt that cannot really be repaid. And really I think that is actually probably the most scary thing that hangs over this passage in Isaiah chapter 9 and 10. Because there is a debt that can't be repaid. You know, one of the things that kind of struck me most in like reading this passage throughout this week is you get to this point in the first bit of chapter 10 where God talks to them about the exile that is to come. And in, those, in the language of verse 4, it says, nothing will remain but to cringe among the captives or fall among the slain. The imminent future for God's people is either they would go into exile or they would die. It's grim. And that was the reality. And what might you expect the next comment to be? And then God's judgment passed? Well, no. It's that drumbeat again. It's still going. Verse 4. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. And then this section ends. Even as they prepare for judgment and exile, a scary reality remains. And that reality is that God's anger has not been fully dealt with. You see, a certain line has been crossed and there would be no going back. You see, these people, the people of Israel, hadn't just rejected an arbitrary set of rules and standards. They had rejected God himself. And the reality was that even after all of this judgment had been heaped out upon them, even as they would be carried off into a foreign land, exiles without their God and without his guiding, still his anger has not been fully satisfied because it can't be. It's terrifying, isn't it? If we don't find it terrifying, then we really should. Even after the sentence has been carried out, God's judgment still has a way to go. It's still not over. There is that justice shortfall here. And it is because there is a debt that cannot be repaid to God. Earlier on in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 6, we saw when Isaiah himself was confronted with the person of God who had seraphim around him shouting, holy, 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 Isaiah's only response was to say, I am ruined. 
How is it possible for a human being to stand before God Almighty? How is it possible for a sinful human being to stand before God Almighty? Well, it isn't. Isaiah needed God himself to provide the means of atonement and of purification. And so even as we go back to that hope in the first half of chapter 9 that God would bring a new king, well, it could have felt slightly hollow for these people that Isaiah is speaking to. A new king, again in the line of David, who would unite the kingdom and bring restoration. But could he really bring restoration when he couldn't change the hearts of the people? Because human beings are just the same, because their hearts don't change, they could have had a perfect king. But that king couldn't do anything about their hearts, surely. And we know this about ourselves, don't we? A few thousand years might separate us from those in the time of Isaiah, but surely one thing we do know is that the human heart has not really changed since the days of Isaiah. You know, just at the end of the Cold War, the political scientist Francis Fukuyama released an essay entitled The End of History. It was a time of unparalleled optimism, and one of the things that Fukuyama argued was essentially that you had gone in history from the imminent prospect of the world being destroyed in the Cuban Missile Crisis 20 years earlier to the end of the Cold War, and now this kind of blanket of peace that was coming over the world. Fukuyama believed, ultimately, that liberal democracy had won and the world would never go back. And we were entering into a new time of prosperity and hope. But the trouble was, the hearts of people don't change, do they? You see, you can choose any institution you want, you can choose any leader you want, but the hearts of people don't change, do they? In the aftermath of World War II, Clement Attlee said that we were going to build the new Jerusalem in England. Well, I'll leave you to decide whether you think we achieved that or not. In 2007, Barack Obama told people that they could change the world. I'll leave you to see whether you believe that has happened or not. You see, the reality is no matter how good the leader, no matter how sound the system, the hearts of men and women simply do not change. And so even after the rebellious, arrogant people of God were either carried off into exile or their bodies strewn over the horizon, God's people still needed a solution that would deal with the problem of the human heart. When the famous Russian dissident writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn found himself in a Soviet gulag imprisoned by the communist regime, he had the foresight to see that it wasn't the Russian leader nor even the system of communism that was the problem. Solzhenitsyn said in the Gulag Archipelago, Gradually, it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. You see, here is the problem that needs fixing. If God's people are ever going to be with God again, here is the problem that needs fixing if God's people are ever truly going to be restored into life with him. Here is the problem that the sacrificial system in Israel sought to address in part. And here is the problem that the promised king of Isaiah chapter 9 would need to deal with in full. And that is why, as the prophecy of Isaiah goes on, what we will see is that the promised ruler of chapter 9 needed to be more than just a great king. He also needed to be a suffering servant. He needed to be that sacrificial lamb who would bear the weight of sin in himself. The one who could find the anger of God not turning away from him, but turning towards him and consuming him. The one against against whom God's wrath and anger would be poured out. You see, the hope for God's people then and the hope for God's people now, the hope for human beings who are filled with pride is a king who wasn't proud but humble. 
in Paul's letter to the Philippians, he reflected on how Jesus was just that, how he humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, in the face of our pride and in the face of a debt that we were not qualified to repay, Jesus came and he humbled himself that he might repay the debt for us. That all of that unsatisfied right anger that hangs over the people of God here at the end of the first half of chapter 10 could be dealt with. And you see, as Jesus hung there on the cross, truly Jesus displayed the character of God in the way that Israel had always failed to do. They had supposed to show God's love and justice and goodness to the world. And as Jesus hung on that cross, dying for the sins of proud, arrogant human beings, he showed us the God of Isaiah 6, who is entirely, blazingly holy and must punish sin. And he also shows us the God who is so full of love for his people that he will meet that punishment in himself. You see, the future was bright. The present was bleak for the people of God. And they would face his judgment for turning away from him. But the reality was that hope was also on offer. Though we rightly face the same fate that God's people did here, his judgment on our sin and pride, instead we can make the choice that they chose not to. The choice of verse 13. They refused to return to the God who struck them and find refuge in him. And yet we can. We can find refuge In Jesus, you see, the only way we fail to find salvation is if we fail to admit we need it. And that was the problem for Israel. They never wanted to admit that they needed God and needed his help. And the sobering message of Isaiah 9 and 10 is that if we continue in that same pride, well, there is a judgment. That judgment will come. But if in humility we come to our God and we seek out his help, salvation can be found, refuge can be found. And so from Isaiah 9 and 10 today, don't let us leave continuing in our pride, but in humility humble ourselves and find refuge from the judgment we deserve. Let me pray and ask God that that might be the reality for each one of us. Our Heavenly Father, we are overwhelmed when we're confronted with our own sin and our own pride. Heavenly Father, might you grant us the grace to humble ourselves before you, to admit that we rightly deserve your judgment just as the people of Israel did, but instead of carrying on in our pride to flee to you and find the refuge and salvation that is on offer in the Lord Jesus. Amen.